Our next speaker will be uh, Siddhartha Shah, a fourth-year PhD student at Columbia University specializing in South Asian and 19th century European art. His dissertation examines the aesthetics of empire the, the, sorry, the aesthetics of empire in British India, focusing on the transformation of indigenous symbols into imperial ornaments invested with new subversive meanings. He received his BA in art history from the Johns Hopkins University, and he holds an MA in East-West Psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies with an emphasis on Hindu philosophy and Jungian psycho psychoanalysis. His talk today, Victoria's Picturesque Natives, Ornamental Indians as Subjects and Servants at Osborne House, will further us down the road then of exploring these superimpositions and displacements. So please welcome Siddhartha Shah. A shipment of 34 Indians arrived in London in the early summer of 1886, brought in to make crafts in a living display of village life at the Colonial and Indian Exhibition. Like many others, Queen Victoria took great interest in the features and mannerisms of the curious natives and commissioned Rudolf Swoboda to paint five of their portraits. Pleased with the picturesque heads she received, the queen dispatched him to India to produce even more paintings, heads representing the various regional types of her most prized imperial possession. Today, nearly 100 Indian heads fill a corridor in Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. An impressive hallway that leads to a lavish Darbar room inspired by the grand reception halls of princely India. At Osborne, Victoria ruled as empress over a miniaturized and domesticated India, an empire at home, which she further outfitted with native attendants whose presence breathed life into her most outrageous Indian fantasies. My study examines the symbolic and aesthetic function of Victoria's Indians in photographs housed at the Royal Collection. Photographs situated at a borderland where global empire merges with cloistered domesticity to elicit a staggering range of meaning and interpretations. The presence of domesticated Indians in a way naturalized and institutionalized British superiority over their Indian subordinates. Yet my aim today is to bring attention to their ornamental function, to highlight the ways in which Indian dress and Indian skin were arranged in photographs to achieve compositional harmony. Indian bodies as decorative props, arranged in a symbolic and picturesque power play of light and dark. In viewing these works, I also confront the ambiguous nature of Victoria's relationship to her Indians, as exotic pets on display, and helpless children to adore, tame, and control. Now, Queen Victoria was radically aware of the power of her image to the monarchy and regularly staged photographs to circulate to the public. With Prince Albert, she fashioned herself as a doting wife in photos that emphasized his dominant size and her passivity. With her nine children, she was a dutiful mum subjected to relentless, endless motherhood. And for most of her life, it was Victoria, the reclusive widow, that her photos conveyed. Distant, solid, and eternally engulfed in black widow's weeds. Though she essentially reigned from the comfort and confines of home, it was the absolute pervasiveness of her image that invested the queen with an aura of omniscience and omnipresence that served her empire well. When it came time to celebrate the Golden Jubilee in 1887, the public was keen to honor their queen's 50-year reign with full fanfare. Victoria, however, who famously avoided publicity, wanted the celebrations to be exceedingly simple and refused to wear state robes or any ceremonial crowns. Concerned by the utter lack of gusto in the aging widow of Windsor, the government resolved to invite Indians to the Jubilee who would liven things up with their characteristic pomp. The bling and glitz of Indian royals was thus viewed as an ample compensation for the queen's absolute lack of charisma. Lord Dufferin compiled a guest list of, quote, the best blood in India, favoring those that he considered most picturesque. The Maharaja of Kuch Bihar was selected because his appearance fit, quote, the British idea of what an Indian Raja should look like, unquote. While the Maharaja of Indore, though described as ill-mannered and vulgar, 
made the cut because the viceroy was sure he would take a large following with him whose gorgeous dresses will help to enliven the Jubilee show. The ornamental function of the Indian guests was further underscored by a dress code that forbade them from wearing European clothing during the Jubilee. An escort of festooned Indian soldiers rode in front of the queen's carriage during her procession and were later arranged around her royal tent for a garden party at Buckingham Palace. Their bodies were distributed in regularly spaced intervals with their backs to the tent and faces turned towards the spectators. Like the Indian royals who had been invited to the Jubilee, the soldiers were employed to ornament the celebrations with their colorful costumes and distinctive features. And it was around this time that Victoria resolved to order some Indians of her own, beginning with a pair of table hands, a sensible starter kit, if you will. Mohammed Baksh, who she described as very dark with a very smiling expression, and the handsome, much younger Abdul Karim. She continued growing her collection and within a year had 12 Indians at her service. Some were employed as cooks to prepare curry, some to wait at table, while most were simply kept on call for such inane tasks as moving boxes and shuttling letters around the house. I believe and argue that they were employed primarily for the novelty and visual spectacle they brought to her home and to her public image. This is further affirmed by the queen's obsessive preoccupation with and control over their physical appearance. She had special uniforms made for them in the style of a North Indian tunic, emblazoned with her royal cipher and embellished with sashes and turbans to be worn at all times. Blue coats with white trousers, waistband and turban for daytime, and red coats with gold trimmed turbans and sashes in the evening. For chilly Scotland, she ordered them tweed overcoats, cut at her insistence, in a distinctly Indian style. Whereas it was the invisibility of servants that was generally praised in Victorian society, the Queen clearly wanted her Indians, and more precisely their Indianness, to be as visible and legible as possible. She quickly devised ways in which to display her natives at home and in photographs. Their oriental color and costume were exciting additions to the tableau vivant she stayed at home, in which the Indians were routinely cast in Eastern roles. An Indian scene features four of her servants dressed in full barbaric splendor, posed around a stuffed tiger and visualized against a jungle backdrop, they appear as if transported back to their native landscape composing a fine tableau of Indians being Indian. Later that year, Princess Beatrice threw on some silk and her mother's jewels to star in the leading role of India, supported by the Princess Royal as a Muslim to her left and the young future Tsarina of Russia, Alex, on her right as a Hindu. Four Indians surround their mother India, holding traditional implements of servitude, including fans, fly whisks, and trays of offerings. The colorful presence and intrinsic otherness of the Indians infused these fantasies with a spectacular authenticity that made the tableau somehow seem real. The Indians appear to ornament and update a composition in this highly staged photo that evokes an idyllic English 18th century English scene. Queen Victoria and her daughter Beatrice sit in a carriage with several horses and individuals flanking the central arrangement. We see Abdul Karim in profile at the far left, and Ahmad Hussein just next to him. But a second photo shows the same scene with a few minor adjustments, namely that the Indians have been swapped. Now we see the profile of Ahmad Hussein and Karim has moved to the back. That they are viewed and treated as interchangeable suggests that their function is decorative. There are ethnic props to move around in place within a composition to maximize on the picturesque potential of their bodies. In other photographs, the turbans, sashes, and dark skin of the Indians are efficiently incorporated into an aesthetic of contrast that emphasizes light over dark. A photo of the queen and family at a dining table offers a compelling example. Victoria is seated at the center, dressed in characteristic black with a white collar and lace headpiece. Indians, dressed in their dark evening uniforms and bound in striking white sashes and turbans, flank her on either side. Their bodies frame Victoria, 
further enunciated by their white accessories, set against their uniform darkness. White waistbands align with her white face, and her prominent white widow's peak is refracted in the pointed white peaks of their turbans. The verticality of the Indians consolidates the tableau around the table, which then reflects the chandelier suspended above it, just as the wooden chair backs in the foreground similarly reflect and refer to the windows at the back. The photograph delivers a clever play of light and dark, contrasts and reflections, where the Indians fulfill a domestic and aesthetic service to the overall harmony of the image. Photos like this one of Indians in royal domestic service underscored their own domestication by the queen. This idea and image of the domesticated Indian is effectively conveyed in a photograph of Victoria that constructs a visual and symbolic relationship between Indian and dog. Abdul Karim hands a letter to the queen who sits at a writing table. Her spine is sturdy and erect, while Karim's lowered shoulders and reticent gaze convey servility and articulate his subordinate position. Swathed in black and set against a distant dark wall, the profile of Victoria appears conspicuously iconic, like the surface of sculpted alabaster, enhanced by the blinding whiteness of her skin. Karim's white turban complements the queen's face, and draws attention then to the white coat of the lazing terrier who sits passively in front of the table. Both Indian and dog appear tame and compliant, a harmless domestic animal placed at the queen's feet and a domesticated Indian placed at her service. But a photo taken five years later employs similar props to stage a similar scene, but with rather jarring differences. The queen is seated at the same writing table Abdul Karim, who is by now her personal tutor and one of the most powerful figures in the household, stands over her with a letter in hand. Victoria, cloaked in a white mantle, slouches in her chair, while Karim stands proud in a thick black coat and dark turban, staring at the camera with a confident, defiant gaze. A different dog sits at Victoria's feet, whose black coat and dark features once again complement those of the Indian as does his outward gaze. Perhaps also intended to convey their shared domestication, Karim and the dog instead come across as not fully tamed or inadequately domesticated. Randy Malamud discusses the displacement of people and animals as a well-established colonial practice in his analysis of 19th century zoos. He argues that the display of exotic animals and human beings arranged for viewing pleasure, establishes a kind of model of empire where the conditions and quality of their lives are negotiated by those who confine, domesticate, and display them. Based on my research, I believe this reading could certainly apply to Victoria's Indians, yet what complicates the Queen's relationship to them is the aggressively maternal approach she took to managing them. They were not simply exotic pets or orientalized automata. They were like children that she cared for, who she was responsible for training and domesticating. In addition to dressing her Indians in clothes that she picked out, Victoria planned their days, arranged their daily lessons, dropped in for visits, and repeatedly nagged her doctor to check on their health. Furthermore, she despised the racism that her household and relatives displayed towards her Indians and fiercely defended them whenever it was called for. Her relationship to and treatment of her Indian servants, I believe, was informed by her own particular maternalistic approach, one which she applied to running a home and family, as in the matriarch who fine-tunes the royal bloodlines of Europe by arranging the dynastic marriages of all of her children, and, one, uh, and an approach she applies to ruling an empire, the monarch who imports Indians to dress up, dominate, domesticate, and display. Manuals written for British women living in India repeatedly equate native servants with children. The placement of colonized people, namely men in this case, into domestic servitude was simultaneously an assertion of imperial control as well as a process of infantilizing domestication, exemplified in the common colonial use of the term boy or houseboy, regardless of the servant's age. Yet this process of domestication was regularly framed as an act of goodwill 
The servants are clothed, fed, trained, kept out of trouble, so they're better off at Osborne than fighting tigers in the jungle. I have found no evidence yet that Victoria consulted any of these texts, but they certainly smack of the same maternalistic imperial rhetoric that defined the queen's relationship to her Indians. Under Victoria's roof and in her pictures, the subservience of her Indians, as well as that of the subcontinent that they represented, was rendered harmless and benevolent. While they were indeed displayed like exotic living curiosities, they were also fashioned as her colonized children, distinctly apart from the white royals they served, as exemplified in the photos that emphasize a difference, but also part of the vast imperial family over which she reigned. Which leads me to the final body of work I would like to share, which I only uncovered last month when the chief archivist of the Royal Photographic Collection suggested I go through the Queen's albums of royal children. What I initially thought was an odd suggestion turned out to be a trove of fantastic photographs which will claim much of my attention over the next few months. Photos of Victoria's grandchildren staged with her Indian servants. Now, one of the primary issues here is that aside from a single mention in the Queen's journals, which states that her grandson loved to be carried around by Buksh, one of the servants, we have no other evidence that the Indians had much contact with these children who had plenty of maids and nurses of their own. As such, the photos invite a dizzying array of questions. I begin as before by examining the aesthetic and symbolic function of Indians in these photos. The earliest series features Mohammed Baksh and Prince Alexander of Battenberg, who's, who's the child that Victoria mentioned in her journals. Baksh wears his blue uniform with substantial white turbans and sash, and the prince wears his white garment, accented with dark sash and matching shoulder bows. The contrasting light and dark shades of their clothing and skin establishes a clear visual distinction between the two, as we've repeatedly seen, but is magnified by their difference in age and scale. The photos in which Buksh holds the child convey the greatest intimacy. Yet where we may read comfort and ease in this series, though I would like to draw your attention to the right hand of Buksh, which I read as so viscerally tense and so emphatically unmoving for the, for the shot. Another series reveals unsteadiness and detachment between the same subjects. The photos show Baksh fumbling his way through a chute as he literally props Alexander up on a table next to a toy sheep. The child looks like a lifeless doll that the Indian manipulates with his thick, dark hands. Baksh, in this image, seems little more than a stabilizing prop. Now, much has been said and written about the symbolic and aesthetic effects of pairing white children with dark servants, a device that invariably amplifies the pristine glow of a child's whiteness. It is an aesthetic or compositional device that appears abundantly across media and in various parts of the world. Laura Wexler, among others, has discussed the mammy and child double portraits of 19th century American photography. Staged in the sentimental mode of mother and child, these photos visualize a deceptive fantasy of domestic dignity that conceals the legacy of oppression and violence within which they were produced. What my research on these photos has revealed is how much has been written and said about white children and dark women, and how much remains to be written and said about white children and dark men. The domesticated Indians are here visualized with props and trimmings of childcare and motherhood, in which their masculinity is on full display within the most feminine of domestic spheres. Is this the image of the domesticated babysitting Indian that perhaps inspired Ramdas in A Little Princess? Or Punjab in Annie, a large dark man in turban and sash who dances, arranges flowers with his mind, um, while also guarding over children with manicured brows and a smoky eye. Victoria's photographs present a utopian vision of interracial, intercultural, intergenerational harmony. But we must look deeper at the power play of dark and light before us. We must look for the shadow. Do these photographs commemorating loving, or do these photographs commemorate loving and caring relationships? Or might they rather memorialize the dynamics of power and servility that place these men in these roles? 
These photos are fantasies curated by those who, even when swathed fully in black, represented a force of light. Multivalent visions of domestic and imperial harmony, these photos effective, effectively obscure the displacement, objectification, and servility of the brown men who pose with these children. And perhaps most unsettling and honest of all is how the images at times and through close looking forebode the superiority and domination that one day the white children will be encouraged to assert against them. Thank you. <laughs>